Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. And we believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Start a new year to give God, there I am. You can hear me now, right? All right. To give God praise and worth to begin the new year this way. So let's stand if you would, and we'll do this responsive reading and the beginning of our worship handout. It'll be on the screen as well. I'll do the leader portion. And just please join aloud in the all portion as we kind of read these words aloud to each other to kind of call ourselves and prepare ourselves to, to think of God this morning. Peace be with you. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous things. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. So, Father, we, uh, as a people, come before you today in this, this new year. And it's a joy to gather together to think about you. Lord, so I pray that you would settle our hearts and minds, that you would help us to be present in this moment and to give you praise and to give you glory and to give you honor and to give you worth. Lord, to realize how great you are. And also, Lord, as we've recently celebrated during the Christmas season that you are God who has come to us. You are Emmanuel, God, with us. And we hold that intention, your closeness, Lord, and your greatness. So I pray that you would open our mouths and fill, fill our lungs and help us to praise you today. And we pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall. There is still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God. Father, we, we declare that you are the ancient of days, that we want to pe be a people who say there is none above you, there is none before you. You are our sure foundation. God, you are all great and all powerful and all holy, and yet you tell us that you are compassionate, you're gracious, you're slow to anger. You're bounding in love. So we, as a people, say hallelujah. Praise you, God. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You know, this is the time in our service where we come to every week where we have this time of community confession. And it isn't a time to, 
to beat ourselves up. This is a time to receive mercy again. This is a time to receive healing. You know, in our prayer of confession, in your worship handout, it'll be on the screen. We're going to say things like, all hearts are open. All desires are known. There are no secrets with God. God, God knows everything. We can't hide from him. And so in acknowledging that, what we're doing is we're, we're opening ourselves up. We're being honest with that. And in doing that, in acknowledging the places that, that we don't want to live that way or the thoughts we don't want to have, when we open ourselves up, when we acknowledge that God knows everything, there we find mercy and there we find healing. And so I invite you to read over this prayer of confession on your own. And then we'll pray this aloud together. And then you'll have a moment just to be with God by yourself. So read this over and reflect on it now. Let's pray this aloud together. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open all desires know, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just take a moment to be with the Lord on your own. Hear these words of encouragement, of forgiveness, of hope from Psalm 32. Then I acknowledge my sin, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. God, we thank you. We thank you that there is no hiding from you, that we really can't play games with you. That all hearts are always open, all Desires are always known. There are no secrets. And Lord, that, that can be a scary thing to be that vulnerable, that open, that exposed to you. And yet you, you want us to come to you that way. Like a child coming fully to their parent, asking for help. And so we, your children, in such great need, we come to you and we find a father not with a clenched fist, but with open arms given mercy and forgiveness and healing. Thank you for your grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've talked during the Christmas season about how we all have a story about our life, but there's one story that defines all our stories. It's the story of what God has done. And the Apostles' Creed has a been a story, if you will. It's been told for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years that the church has declared. And in beginning in this new year, let's stand now and let's declare this story again. The work of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The story that shapes our story. With one voice, let's declare this aloud with, with vigor, huh? With vigor. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born with the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name Lord Jesus, there is no better place to be on this day than here worshiping you. And so we come here this morning to center our lives on you, our Lord and Savior. We take a moment to look back on the previous year 
and realize that you are there and your providential care consistently holds us up. We look forward in expectancy and we know, we know that you will continue to care for us. That you will protect us from all evil. That you will keep us in your loving arms. Knowing this is often just too wonderful for us to comprehend. So we thank you for this moment where we acknowledge that before you. May everything we do this coming year, to the best of our ability, be pleasing in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, Michael Bottomley and his family are visiting their family in Canada. What? Uh, and hopefully they'll get back safely. I don't know if any of you have any relatives that... Uh, we're allegedly flying on Southwest this week. Uh, we had a couple of uh, incidences and issues in our family, and it was, it was good. We got a little extra time with our, our children, so that's, that's always a blessing. Uh, now is the opportunity for the middle school and the pre, uh, pardon me, the elementary school to go back in the back, meet your families. Uh, <laughs> boy, I'm a little out of shape here, aren't I? Uh, meet your school teachers. And uh, let's quickly pray, actually, for them. Lord God, we pray for our students. We pray that they learn on their own to hide your word in their hearts. May they recognize that your word is a lamp unto their feet and a light for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, five minutes to greet those around you. Just five minutes. We were going to make it 10 today, but we decided to leave it at five. So there you go. All right. Finish up those handshakes and hugs and hellos and happy New Year's and good job greeting everybody. Uh, I always feel bad breaking that up, but the show must go on. You know, there's a, um, for those who are fans of, of soccer, there's a team in Liverpool and they have this slogan that says, you'll never walk alone. And I always like that when I think about the, the, the church, this idea that we're not meant to walk alone in this life, that we're meant to do it in community with each other. And so that's why at Covenant, beyond just Sunday mornings, we have opportunities to, to be in community, to, to be known and to know others. And so as you're thinking about this new year and you're not in community and you're not known by others and you're not pouring into other people's lives, it's a great opportunity to maybe try something out. And so we have community groups in the back of your worship handout explains more about them. They're just um, they're groups that meet during the week in homes throughout the city um, and kind of study scripture together, pray together, encourage each other, have fun together. If you're interested in that, there's information and um, you can reach out to Kennerly about that. We also have men's and women's Bible studies. There'll be more information about women's Bible study coming up in the weeks to come. But we have a men's Bible study coming up on Saturday, January 21st, 9 to 1030. And you can talk to uh, Bob more about that. But again, just be praying about that as, as we're thinking about new rhythms in the new year. Um, ask yourself, are you in community? Are you known? Are you known by others? And maybe, maybe try something out um, this new year. I'm going to pray for our community, and then we'll have our scripture reading, and Kennerly will come up to preach for us. So let's pray together. Father, as we enter into this uh, new year, and with a room this size, and people, we're, we're probably in this space and experiencing this service with a lot of different emotions. So Lord, I, I, feel, I pray for those who feel a sense of and heaviness of guilt right now. Lord, would you, would you relieve that? For those who might be feeling a sense of, of shame, would you, would you lift that burden? 
Lord, for those who are feeling alone, Lord, would you draw them to community? Jesus, for those who might be feeling a sense of emptiness, would you fill them with the mercy only you can fill with? Lord, for those who might have a sense of contentment, Lord, would you draw them to those who need to be lifted up? For those who feel a sense of abundance, Lord, would you bring us a heart of generosity? And for all of us, whether we are feeling like we're on a mountaintop or in a valley, whether we're high or we're low, Lord, may all of us in this space find our rest in you. May all of us pick up the easy yoke of Jesus. And thank you, God, that you're good and that you're good to us. And I pray as we read our scripture today and hear the message, God, we need your help. We need your help to have ears to hear hearts to receive, feet to put it into action. So would you help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Alicia to come up and read our scripture today. Okay, our scripture reading is from Colossians 1, um, verses 3 through 14. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in the heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it, ha as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Alicia and Patrick, for leading us in worship. As we've, uh, I think we've all kind of said, it's so fitting for us to be gathered here this morning at the start of a new year, to be gathered together in worship, to be fixing our eyes on Jesus. And what a joy it is for us to be able to freely do this. A gift we don't want to take for granted and a gift that we should be filled up with joy to be experiencing in this time and in this moment this morning. I have a little bit of a hard time realizing this, but it was just last week that we celebrated Christmas. It feels like more than a week, but just last week we were remembering, as Patrick reminded us, the true story that redeems all of our stories. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, the word made flesh. The angels sang, the shepherds were amazed. Mary and Joseph physically held the faithfulness of God and rejoiced. It's the thrill of hope. It's Emmanuel. It's God with us. And our response to this good news is rightfully thanksgiving. We celebrate because we've received the greatest gift in Jesus, our forgiveness and our restoration. And it's the joy of this gift that now we have, as we've just read, fills Paul's heart and fills his words in Colossians 1 as he prays for the church. So we're going to look at how Paul prays and we're going to look at what Paul prays for through three angles. We're going to look at it as prayer as rhythms, not resolutions. Prayer that is personal and not private, and prayer that is for training and not trying. So rhythms, not resolutions. I think especially around New Year's, we think in terms of goals, we think in terms of resolutions, and I'm not wanting you to throw all those out the window, but self-improvement is a growing industry, and New Year's resolutions 
Typically, you can maybe think in your mind of what the top three most popular resolutions usually are. They all kind of usually circle around physical health, right? Eating more healthy, exercising more, losing weight. And we kind of, these get stale because we know that these resolutions that are a matter of trying harder usually fail because they're a matter of self-effort. And we know ourselves, we get distracted, we lose interest, we lack willpower. Resolutions are something that we try to add to life rather than working it into our lives. And I think Christians, I think we may think of our spiritual health in a similar way. We can say to ourselves, if only I could be more disciplined, I would read my Bible more, I would pray more, I'd be a better Christian. But we're not called to try harder resolutions that are dependent on our effort. And Paul, in the words that we just heard read this morning, Paul models for us prayer that is rooted in rhythms of grace. Think of the difference between cut flowers and a potted plant. A bouquet of daisies is pretty in a vase. It goes in easily, and it's really delightful to look at for a couple days, maybe, until we have to throw out the dead flowers. Now, a potted fiddle leaf is rooted in soil, and it requires regular water, regular sunlight. It needs to be tended to in a rhythm of care. And in return, it's longer enjoyment. It lasts longer. Cut flower prayers may sound nice, but they soon wither because they're not rooted in real life. Look at verse 3. Paul begins in verse 3. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when, not if, we pray for you. And in verse 9, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. Paul prays without ceasing, and it's Not incessant mystical experience that he is doing, but it is faithful care. It's regular watering. He is maintaining or observing regular times of prayer as a daily rhythm. And it's not haphazard and just based on whether or not he's in the mood to pray. It is a regular pattern, an observing of time that is set where he enters into prayer as a disciplined practice that is never finished. It's muscle memory, repeatedly drawing our attention back again and again and again to our great hope in the gospel. Paul's rhythm of praying has impacted what he pays attention to and what he cares about, how God is working and how the Colossians are responding. Yes, this takes effort, but the concentration and the attention that doesn't come naturally at first becomes instinctive with practice. Some of you may remember this better than others, but like when we used to have to regularly dial phone numbers to talk to people, and we had those phone numbers memorized, the people that we called regularly, you didn't even have to think about it. These verses, in a similar way, encourage us to make a practice of prayer. And yes, we will get distracted, but we draw our attention back again and again and again in a daily rhythm that repeats and never stops, like water and sunlight. Now, regularity, just doing this in a regular practice, will not itself produce fruit any more than light or uh, water produce life. But prayer tethers us to Christ. We become what we practice. And our daily rhythms are what shape and define our lives. So pray. Do it morning, noon, and night. When you wake up, at lunch, before you go to bed. Pray out loud. Pray scripture. Pray these verses. Pray a psalm a day. Pray the Lord's Prayer. Keep it short and be simple. You can write down your prayers, you can kneel, you can walk, and you can ask a mature Christian to pray with you regularly. Just do it and keep doing it. This is a practice that we never grow out of, we never graduate from, we never retire from. 
It's a rhythm of praying that we need as an abiding lifeline, drawing our attention again and again to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul prays in rhythm, not resolution. He prays regularly. And he also prays relationally. Paul's prayers are personal, but not private. And while it's popular to practice meditation and self-reflection, Paul draws us out of a privatized spirituality. Paul invites us into relational prayer that is on behalf of others. Prayer is conversation that is with God and for the sake of others. So first off, Paul thanks God. He thanks God for the Colossians' faith and love. He gives God the credit for them, for their faith, not them. He asks God to fill them with the knowledge of God's will, and he gives joyful thanks to the Father for the redeeming work of Christ. God is the center and the focus of Paul's prayer. He's the personal object of our praise and thanksgiving. And in some ways, that feels like that should go without saying, but does our praying sound more like a shopping list of requests? Or does it reflect a conversation with our Lord Jesus? Paul remembers who he's talking to. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. This God revealed in the Bible is the one that we pray to. And that rightfully leads us, I think, to two uh, responses or postures to be in while we pray. And they are, uh, seem like there are opposing ends, but we have to hold these together. Because this rightfully gives us humility. Like the prophet Isaiah, we can say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, not worthy to stand in the awesome, holy presence of the Lord. And yet we also need to have boldness to engage with the one who in Revelation says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The intimate setting of a meal shared together. In prayer, we personally enter into conversation with the word made flesh. Prayer is not private, self-focused meditation, but personal conversation with our creator and redeemer who desires to come in and eat with us. And throughout this prayer, Paul uses the first person plural. He says we, he says us. His prayer is joined with others. We give thanks, we have not stopped praying. Prayer is certainly an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation with God. But when we study scripture, we see that prayer is shared work. It's not just for pastors and elders and Sunday school teachers. It's for every Christian. So Paul prays with others and he prays for others. And here specifically, he prays for the Colossians. These are Christians living in Colossae, a small town in the western part of modern-day Turkey. It was once a prominent town, but now it was living in the shadow of neighboring, kind of more prominent cities like Laodicea. Colossae was about 100 miles inland from Ephesus, where Paul likely wrote this letter. And it was a church that Paul had never visited. He'd never been there. He hadn't seen their faces but he had heard about them from Epaphras, a fellow minister. We naturally pray for those close to us, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our neighbors, and this is good and important. If we don't, who will? But Paul expands our boundaries and stretches our praying reach to include those that we maybe only ever hear about and haven't had the chance to yet meet. Paul prays globally, including this distant church, because he cares so deeply that the gospel in verse 6 is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. This year, we as a church here at Covenant have begun supporting a church plant in Birmingham, Alabama called Church of the Cross. And Patrick and I know Zach Hicks, who's the pastor there, and my parents are involved in helping as well. So we have our Epaphrases for this church. And we've heard how the gospel is bearing fruit and growing in this church. 
So I want to invite us as a church, we as Covenant, to pray these verses for this Church of the Cross in Birmingham, Alabama. In regular rhythms of prayer, Paul prays to God in personal thanksgiving for the gospel growth in others. This is how Paul prays, regularly and personally. And I want us to now consider what Paul prays for, because Paul prays for the church to be trained in the gifts that God has given, not to try harder to live a worthy life. Paul is concerned with training, not trying. What's the difference between training and trying? If I were given a beautiful quality violin, I would not automatically know how to play it. I would not know how to make a beautiful sound with it. If I said I was going to try to play the violin, it would mean, I, you could imagine, I pick up the violin and I probably don't know how to hold the bow right or where to put my fingers. And I could attempt to play a song, but it would not be a beautiful sound. It would be a noisy failure. It would not be recognizable or enjoyable. So sure, I can try to play the violin, but my best efforts as a non-musician, without knowledge, without practice, without teaching, and without more practice, would end in noisy failure. And it sounds optimistic to say I'll try, but it's a rather hopeless effort. However, if I say that I am going to train to be a violinist, it's a very different picture. It's a pic different picture of what I intend to do. Training involves time, it involves commitment, it involves access to a violin in this case, a rhythm of practice, a learning how to handle the instrument, being taught by someone else who can instruct me, and then perseverance through failure and doing the hours and hours and hours of playing in order to be a violinist. I saw this reality in action in my four-year-old son, Jonah, when we started doing swimming lessons. So Jonah was a little bit nervous, understandably, and I said, Jonah, you just have to try. And I haven't, hadn't prepared for this sermon, obviously. I might not have <laughs> said that. So I said, you just have to try. And then something switched, as it can, in a four-year-old mind. And he decided to try. And so without waiting for the swim instructor's attention, he walked right in, down the steps, into the water, and kept going until he sank. And the swim instructor, who was right there, picked him up after his head went under the water, and he was smiling, and he said, I can swim. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. But the point is, you know, Jonah tried, but he couldn't swim. He needed to train. And Paul had heard that the Colossians had received and truly understood God's grace, the gospel, making them God's holy people, as are we. His prayer was primarily not concerned for them to get salvation, but for them to live out their salvation, growing more and more in the likeness of Christ as his followers. So as described in verses 12 through 14, the Colossians had been qualified to share in God's inheritance. They had been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. They had been qualified. They had been rescued. They had been brought into God's kingdom. All of these descriptions describe something that is completed. It had been completed for them by Jesus through his death and resurrection. God's people cannot be any more qualified or any more rescued their life, their value, their purpose, <coughs> and joy had all been richly provided. So now they needed to enjoy it. They needed to work it out through continual training. Two aspects of Paul's prayer that guide us in this training are thankfulness and obedience. So Paul begins and he ends with thankfulness. He thanks God for their faith. In Jesus Christ, their love for all God's people, 
and their hope stored up for them in heaven. He's thankful for what God has given to the church. These are signs of life in the spirit. And Paul always thanks God for these qualities. Always. He doesn't take them for granted. He doesn't move past them. He doesn't uh, lose interest in them. He is never ceasing in valuing the gift of faith in Jesus. Love across lines of division of all God's people and an overflow of hope in the reality of heaven. These are ongoing concerns for Paul. His thankfulness regularly waters and provides light for these gifts, faith, love, and hope. Very briefly, faith, I want to point out, is not vague. It's specifically in Christ Jesus. The certain belief that God raised Jesus from the dead and that he offers all believers, Jews and Gentiles, the same promise of life. And love that gives itself away, looking to the interest and the benefit of others, love in the spirit that is not restricted by race or political affiliation, by age or education or economic standing, not just for some, not just for the lovable, but for all God's people. Covenant has formed a good neighbor team with World Relief kind of over the past few months. And this team has come alongside a family that was uh, that recently arrived in San Diego from Afghanistan, had to flee when the Taliban took over. Through grocery gift cards and meals and conversations and donations of basic needs, including clothing, this team is looking to the interest of this family, looking to their benefit and to their good. And I was struck that this team was formed before ever getting matched with a family, before ever knowing the faces or names of the people that they would be able to help. And I think that that is a powerful reflection of God's love for, of our love reflected by, from God of all God's people. A love that is compelled to seek out those in need because Christ has first loved us. So faith and love spring from the hope stored up for us in heaven, the hope of glory, the thrill of resurrection life, a new reality when all wrongs will be made right. No more disease, no more death, but life and rejoicing in the city of God. This faith, love, and hope are fruit of the gospel. These are the blessings from God that we need constantly. So we never stop thanking God for these as he constantly is faithful to provide them for us, just like water and sunlight. And second, obedience. What Paul is thankful for and then what he asks God for are very closely connected. And there's actually only one thing in this whole prayer, there's only one thing that Paul asks God for, and he says he does it continually. In verse 9, Paul asks that God would fill the church with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. This is a matter of obedience. When we pray for God's will, I think we tend to think of it in terms of wanting God to clarify my future and my choices and my needs. And we should bring all of our concerns to God. He is invited and welcomes us to do that. But I think we can, and we should be aware that we can become easily self-centered in praying for God to bless our will rather than receiving God's will. Paul here is not praying for the church to try to figure out God's will. Paul is praying for the church to do God's will. And throughout scripture, knowledge and action are bound together. Knowledge means action. Someone doesn't know something unless he or she does it. Just like Jonah doesn't know how to swim unless he does it. We do not have to find God's will. He's given it to us in the Bible. He reveals it to us through the Spirit. And our learning is actually in the obeying of what God has already told and equipped us to do, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. 
And as we practice living out God's truth in our lives will naturally be what Paul describes in verses 10 through 12. Worthy, pleasing to God, fruitful, growing, strengthened, equipped with endurance in difficult circumstances, and patience with difficult people. It's his glorious might, not ours, that strengthens us to remain faithful and steadfast and persevering through the storms of life. This is what we're training for. And this is how Christians can have joy in all circumstances. Training in obedience requires listening and learning. It takes time and commitment. Notice in verse 7, Paul says the Colossians learned the gospel from Epaphras. We don't become competent, mature Christians overnight. We have to learn. We have to be taught. We have to study. We have to practice. We need others, and not just once, but continually. We need others to speak God's truth into our lives. We need to see what it looks like to love mercy. We need to share with others what we've learned. We need the church. And I hope we can all think of an Epaphras in our lives, somebody who has loved us, who has encouraged and shown us the Christian life. But I also hope that we can all be an Epaphras to someone else, winsomely speaking and living God's truth and love. So this morning, I want to leave you with a question of who is learning the gospel from you? And I want to encourage you to pray these verses for them. Because as we begin a new year, my hope is that we may all pray in daily rhythms, personally to God, in consideration of others, for the enduring and patient perseverance and obedience of the church. Prayer that is marked by joyful thanks from beginning to end, because we've been qualified We've been rescued. We've been brought into the kingdom of the Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And this good news that Paul declares in those final verses is exactly what we get to proclaim and to celebrate in the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we thank you for your gifts of faith, love, and hope. And we taste and see your love as we remember your work on the cross and the bread and the cup. So I ask now that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will through all wisdom and understanding that your spirit gives so that we may live lives worthy of you and pleasing to you in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in knowledge of you, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, so that we may have endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to you, Father, because you have made us your holy people. And as your holy people, together, Lord, we pray, as you taught your disciples how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. This table is welcome to all those who trust in Jesus. I invite you to, as you're ready, to come to the middle aisle, and then you may 
uh, take the elements on the side. There is a juice that is white and wine, and the, uh, you may take the bread and the um, cup <laughs> as, uh, as you're ready. So please come. Please rise for the last song. So 
promise to go into the new year. God will never fail us. Receive this benediction as we go today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and throughout this new year. Amen.